Hi, everyone. What an honor to be here on the stage, but also, of course. Um, you're going to see a different me after today because um, I've been waiting for this moment for two days. So after I've done my talk, I'm just going to go out there and go completely wild. So look out for that. So, um, hi. I'm talking about how our broken bits are our superpowers. And at first glance, that might seem really trite. But take a little journey with me, and I hope to show you how it doesn't just apply to me and my experiences, but you and everyone you come into contact with, and hopefully we can start a wave of accepting those broken parts of ourselves and making those things the very things that make us unique and fabulous. So, the reason I'm particularly nervous today is... Well, I feel less nervous now I'm up here, you know. But uh, I've been a teacher, and I'm not at the moment, but I have been a teacher for about 15 to 18 years, dealing with the most difficult, delinquent little shits that you can imagine. And if I can wrangle roomfuls of gobby teenagers, 15, 16, who don't want to listen and don't give a shit, and by the end of spending a little bit of time with them, make them feel great, laugh, and want to come and give me a hug, then hopefully I can wrangle any room. I mean, you guys are a little bit different, but... And then... Uh, last November, my life changed because I went on an expedition last summer and it was supposed to be six months long. And after three weeks, I had to come off in the US because I was not feeling right. And I couldn't figure out why I wasn't feeling right. And so what I did was I went to Seattle and got on a three-day ferry I couldn't get off to Alaska to see if that would help. Um, it didn't help, but it was very interesting. And then after bopping around the US for a bit, I ended up in Oregon, in Portland with some very kind people, flew home, phoned a psychiatrist <laughs> and was diagnosed with ADHD. So that's my pill bottle. And the reason why I worried today whether I would be on form for giving great talk is because I started taking these pills in March after a titration period, which was fucking awful. Um, but very interesting. I'll write a book about that. <laughs> but I thought, if I'm going to stand up on a stage, maybe the fire, maybe the, the glorious energy, the ability I have to connect, to make people feel seen, to make everybody feel part of the same team, that thing I've always had that was ineffable. Maybe when you take the Scooby-Doo mask off, underneath is not me, it's fucking ADHD. And now I'm taking the medication. Maybe I'll just be bland. So I... I couldn't decide whether to take my meds today or not. <laughs> so you can tell me later whether you think I did. Um, <laughs> so um, I just gave you a little flash of the next slide. And that is because, to move on, sometimes how we perceive ourselves to be is not how others perceive us, which ties into that idea that our broken bits are our superpowers, what we're most ashamed of, those things that we think we can't show anyone. Maybe people can actually already see and have already accepted, and it's you that's holding tightly to them. So one rather amusing example of this was once I was diagnosed with ADHD, I thought, fuck it, I put it on my Instagram, you know, let's just, I'm not afraid of sharing things. Um, because the more we share, the less people feel shit about themselves. So I posted a couple of things. I thought, great, something to talk about is really interesting, you know. And then things got really difficult with the titration period. And I thought, oh, God, I better share that as well, that things are going wrong. So I did, and then uh, some journalists got in touch with me. And one of them was from The Sun. And uh, she said, we'd love to do a piece, very zeitgeisty girl. I'm um, amazed, you know, she spoke like that from the sun, no offence, but I was in, wasn't expecting exactly that conversation. And it was a conversation of great gravitas, and I was very seriously chatting to her, thoughtfully heartfelt about my issues with distraction and focus and how I have hyper energy and sometimes I crash, and hoping to reach out to other women in their early 40s who might be experiencing the same thing. Great, she said, fabulous. Read the article back to me, and I thought, spot on. And then I waited with bated breath until it hit the newsstands. So how we think we come across is often not how we're perceived. Uh, the headline is phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know how she got that from the conversation, but she's fucking bang on, you know. Um, <laughs> And I, um, I've pivoted, and that's going to be a range of uh, T-shirts and hoodies coming soon. Uh, I love danger. I get bored of men on the back, I think should work. So it's just <laughs> an amusing example of how often the broken bits can actually make people laugh and feel good. So 
On to the real story, because that was just a sidebar. By the way, with ADHD, you have time blindness, which means I'm not looking at the clock. Um, so, I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> on the left is me making a rather ramshackle go kart for my dog. That dog died, not on my watch, but um, yeah. And here is me a couple of months ago on a little ferry that joins across a creek. I'm Cornish, proudly so. And uh, I was on a hike. <clears throat> Never ending talk about hiking this weekend, eh? But I was on another hike, and this dog was called Polly. My new dog is called Bill Murray. Um, and Bill Murray and I are off for a hike around the Lizard Peninsula. Why dogs on screen? Well, what's really important to note is that I've always wanted a dog of my own. And for many, many, many years, I just craved a dog. Couldn't have a dog. Why couldn't I have a dog? Because a dog needs a walk. Dog needs to move around. Dog needs a reliable owner who can show up and take it out and around the block, whatever. I couldn't do that. I was very, very fit and healthy through my late teens. Uh, I used to row for my county, run, and then I got quite poorly. So this is also me. Um, when I was born, my feet were a bit wonky. They turned in. I had to wear casts on my legs to straighten them out for a little while. Sounds dreadful. Wasn't as bad as all that. Grew up climbing trees, having a wonderful time in Cornwall, sailing, surfing, etc. And then, because my feet still turned in a little bit, my uncle said, my uncle you know, does very well in London, and uh, he said to my mum, I think we should get her seen by a specialist, just because she's got a little bit of a funny gait, and I'm worried what that will mean when she gets older. And we were like, okay, so maybe 12, 13, off to Harley Street to a specialist I never saw again, who made me walk on a treadmill in my pants, feeling, you know, you're that age, I just feel absolutely disgraceful, like, ooh, sitting on a plastic chair in my big knickers, while he talks to me about how... Well, Gail, what we think is uh, you're probably going to lose the ability to walk by the time you're 40. Um, and if you don't get your feet smashed and reset, you'll be, you know, debilitated and the pain will be horrendous for you. And uh, I just think that's something you should know and probably move forward with. And I went, OK, <laughs> thanks, see you later. And I left because I wouldn't let my mum come in the room. And she said, how did that go? And I was like... Wicked. Uh, okay. <laughs> she's like, do you want to talk about it? My mum's wonderful, and she's you know, not going to press me at that age to go into any details. I'm like, later. Didn't tell anyone about what he'd said. It was a private appointment with no follow-up necessarily, so no one ever found out. So I was like, yes, probably fucking lied to me. Brilliant. Not really anything to worry about. And then in my early 20s, I started to get quite a lot of pain up through the right-hand side of my body. And I thought, oh, God, it's from rowing too hard. I was stroke rower for the crew, setting the pace and big seas around Cornwall. And I gave up rowing for a bit. Didn't help. Pain got worse. Didn't want to go to the doctor. Who wants to boy, boy, uh, bother the doctor? And also, you know, every boring bastard's got a bad back because we're all like this all the time. So it's like another bad back. However, worse, 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 lots and lots of issues and trauma, and ultimately, uh, I ended up having what's called chronic pain. I had no concept of what chronic meant. I was living in a world in my brain where I believed that doctors would have answers, that if you ever actually went and presented yourself in front of a medical professional, that they would have a solution. And in fact, that was so heavily embedded in my mind that I didn't perceive that they didn't know what was wrong with me for a very long time. And I took all sorts of pills they gave me, had MRI scans. And ultimately, I was referred to what's called the pain clinic. This is like maybe six years down the line, which I considered to be the knacker's yard, which is where you send the horses before you make them into cat food, you know? Um, the end of the line when no one has any answers. But up until that point, I had um, had a lot of faith in the system, and I still have a lot of faith in our medical system. Um, but I also felt like I maybe wasn't doing enough myself, you know, diligently asking questions, how can I heal myself? But during that process, a very gregarious, energized young woman, always out dancing, partying, middle of the social scene, had just retreated from all of that. Because um, an invisible illness is a whole nother story, but when you're suffering from something invisible, you have to remind people all the time that you're in pain, and nobody ever wants to be the person who only ever says, I'm in pain. How are you doing? Well, actually, everything fucking hurts. I can barely wear clothes that touch my skin because it's so agonizing. I drive three times around the supermarket car park and go home in tears because I know I can't risk how busy it is in case anyone barges me with a trolley. So I have no food at home, but I won't tell anyone because I don't want to be embarrassed and not be fun, Gail. 
So years of retreating and retracting from friendships, relationships, society. The one thing I kept was my job. So I've worked with young people, always um, been a teacher in different capacities, and that was my passion, my fire. It was my purpose, and if I didn't teach, if I couldn't engage, if I couldn't go in and be the facilitator of lifting other people into their space of potential, of helping people reach the platform where they could fly, then what was the point of me? Then it would be time to give everything up. So I developed an opiate addiction because that's what they gave me. I didn't realize it was an opiate addiction until later, and we'll briefly get to that. Um, <laughs> so that's how I kept going. I would crawl out of bed, use my arms to get to the shower on some days, the pain was so profound. Shower, take tons of drugs, go to school, be amazingly energetic with the kids. And the students I worked with did very well, but not because I was a great teacher, I was just a great space for them to move through into their own potential, really. I'm like just a portal, <laughs> a mirror, so they can see their wonderful qualities, which lots of them just don't believe in. So um, that was actually, those black eyes, and I've never told anyone this before, I had to bring something new to the table, I did those to myself because I'd got to the point of unspeakable self-loathing about how detached I was from my body, how I distrusted my physical body, that I lived in my brain and my head. And I was so, so, so at the end of my tether, the only person I could beat up was myself. So in one moment of unspeakable depression and anger, I punched myself in the face repeatedly. My poor mother had to run upstairs. I was at their house going, what are you doing? Pulling my fists off my face. And then I thought, I need to take a photograph. This is my lowest moment. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But <laughs> it was a great shot, though, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so, back at the knackers' yard, the pain clinic, uh, I spoke to a, a chap, um, and uh, he said to me, Gail, the problem is, really, you're not taking those pills. Take the gabapentin, take this. I'm like, it makes me slurry and blurry, and I can't do my fucking job. Well, you're going to have to give up your job. And I said, well, I'm not going to give up my job. And he said, Gail, the problem with you is that you keep hoping. You need to give up hope. Because if you keep hoping, you cannot accept. And if you do not accept, then you cannot live. So you have to drop the hope, be realistic, and accept the situation you're in. And I said, well, I said a few things. Uh, and uh, one of those was no. And the other one is take fucking meds back, but without swearing, because I was brought up very well. Um, and I said, look, my body worked. It doesn't work now. That doesn't happen by accident. There'll be a solution, and I'm going to go and find a solution. If I have to crawl by my fingernails, I'm not giving up. I'm here. I'm present. I'm showing up, trying to be well, trying to still offer something to society. And you're telling me to just stop. I'm not going to stop. And he went, well, on your head be it. And I said, yeah, thanks, bye. And off I went. So that's what he said. You need to give up hope. Well, fuck that. We're all about hope today, aren't we? So I might send him a little email when I get back. Um, <laughs> actually, he was the old guard of the pain clinic. I think now um, they, they're much more around the biopsychosocial model of pain management, looking at the 360 view of how you live your life. You know, like spinal tap, the, the dial can go up to 11 if you let it, if you're stressed and tired, etc. So you need to turn the dial down. Good food, good people, sunlight, calm, breathing, all that shit, you know. So I traveled the world in my school holidays full of opium um, so I could get about the place, you know. And I went fasting in the Thai jungle for 12 days at a time. <coughs> really good, by the way. All, you know, Pilates, swimming, transcendental meditation, and everything helped a little bit for a little while. And I couldn't understand why it wasn't curing me. But I kept trying. And then I was, um, like I said, my, my job was very important to me. So uh, I was then seconded by the British government to the European Commission as a representative of excellence in British teaching. And the European Commission place they sent me to was in Varese, which is between Lega Maggiore and Lega di Como in Italy. That's my best Italian. Uh, and <laughs> when I got there, I thought, fuck, yeah, see, I'm not a failure. I can still achieve things even though I'm fucked. And... Uh, <laughs> And then I realized I'd made a huge error because I'd let go of all those things that made me feel okay, which were my family, my friends, my Pilates instructor, my chiropractor, my doctor with the prescriptions. And I ended up on a UNESCO World Heritage Site mountain in a tiny little house by myself, not speaking any Italian, not knowing anyone, and not having a doctor, 
oh, ego, ego taking me there, but also the idea that I must still be succeeding even though I'm also dying. And then one night, as I sat on my balcony looking at the trees below me, I thought, I've been vomiting with pain for four hours. I've got to teach in the morning. I'm just going to... I looked over the balcony, lots of lovely green trees far below, and I thought, I'm just going to yeet myself off there, actually. You know, that'd be OK. It looks really soft down there. I'm just going to shuffle myself off. Go. And I thought about mum and dad and my sister, and I thought, how many times I've been close to that place before? And I thought, oh can't fucking do it to them. And then I thought, well, I can't be the person that phones them and has to pretend my voice is stable for the rest of my life. I can't be like, everything's great, when everything isn't great. So I went through my wallet. And as I went through my wallet, looking at photographs of my mum and my dad and my sister and my best friends and the little notes they'd given me because I was moving to a different country, I found um, a card from my chiropractor. And it had a number written on the back. And I remember that Simon had said to me, Gail, fucking hell, OK, you're going to get in trouble when you're over there. And I was like, no, I'm fucking not. ADHD there, clearly, I didn't know that. Um, and uh, he said, here's somebody I saw give a conference once. I think he's near you in Como, and he might be really useful if you get in trouble. I said, yeah, yeah, I just stuffed it in, you know, forgotten about that. When I saw it on the balcony, I was like, oh, OK, yeah, I need to call this guy. Um, so I left. It was like death, phone call, death, phone call. I made a phone call uh, in that snot bubble crying way you do when you've had, you know, <laughs> my terrible Italian. Next day, phone call back, come into the office. We went in. I went in. I don't know who we is. I went into the office. <laughs> Me and my pain, who I'd made friends with by that point, you know, actually, that was the best thing I ever do was make friends with my pain. I was always fighting it, but even that language, I'm going to fight my condition, is bullshit. If you fight it, you create a whole energy of, of conflict in your own form. So when I absorbed pain as my friend, I was like, okay, yo, pain, what are we doing today? I'm not doing fucking anything. I'm like, well, could we walk to the shop? Oh, all right. Then. So, you know, we do it together, pain and I. So pain and I went there, and he did a scan of my head, and he said, Oh, uh, yeah, no wonder you've been in agony for ages. Your jaws were fucked up. And I was like, oh, he didn't say that, obviously. Um, and uh, so I spent two years. Well, he said, I, I can give you a solution. We can fix you. My wife and I, she's a dentist. I'm a chiropractor. We can definitely fix what's going on. And I was like, oh, my God, no one had an answer before in 15 years. And then he said, and that'll be 20,000 euros. And I was like, oh, shit. OK, OK. So it wasn't that much because I was quite charming. Got a bit of a discount. Over the two years, I whittled him down to at least eight. Grand. And, uh, <laughs> and realigning my jaw, redesigning a little bit how my teeth met, unwound all the pain in my body. And it was a long process, but it was an incredible process. And I'm glad I had hope enough to, to arrive at that day and did not yeet myself off said balcony. Um, anyway, uh, the, the clock is ticking. I'm not looking. Um, yeah. <laughs> Don't look. So I thought to myself, woohoo, I got my body back. I always said I was going to get my body back. And all those people who sit watch the telly with good bodies, well, I'm going to use mine and do something epic. And then I got offered a job as director of academic programs in Hong Kong. And I went, body feeling great. Ooh, Hong Kong promotion. Woo, yeah. So off I went to Hong Kong as director of academic programs and thought, brilliant office, training people, teaching staff to deliver excellent lessons and facilitating students going to like Harvard and Yale and Oxford and Cambridge. And what the fuck was I doing? And then one of my best mates came to see me, a guy called Andy, nicknamed Kinsey. And we share a birthday. So he came to Hong Kong and we hung out. We had a great birthday. And I love him very much. And six weeks later, he hung himself. And um, I got that phone call in the office when I was in Hong Kong. And I thought, what the fuck am I doing with my life? I got my body back. And I came for a job in Hong Kong. Fuck me. Went straight home and thought, what's the one thing I've wanted to do since I was small? I know. I'm going to hike the fucking Appalachian Trail. <laughs> so. <laughs> The longest I'd spent in a tent prior to that point was for about three days, music festival, waking up with empty cans of Strongbow around my head. And I thought, that's pretty good preparation for this. Um, so I went southbound, because it's the hardest way. I thought, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to go in hard. Um, and I did. I hiked. The Appalachian Trail started up in the north in Maine at Katahdin. And it was not a... <sighs> It wasn't an easy journey. I'm sorry, there's more walking in this. You know, this is like, we need to, oh, I'm going to play you this. This is day one, a little message to my family and friends at home. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, day one of six months. I'm not trying to be funny, but this boulder field is pretty intimidating. 
don't know if I can show you. It just goes straight up. <laughs> I can't actually see the way up. I mean, I can. There's loads of that way. go i'm good to go uh nothing really hurts everything's loosened up after the first bit where everything hurt quite a lot um about two hours ago when i first started now everything's all like hey this is what we're doing okay let's do it so pain levels are all right but i did smash some codeine and naproxen this morning um all right i'm gonna try and get up this beast with you after that. Mm. I hope you're doing something equally taxing today. If not, you're very lazy and you need to go do it. Not really. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> my, <laughs> my family love these messages from me from various points of the trail. Okay, so it wasn't easy, it was a fucking nightmare, but it was actually also the most amazing thing I've ever done. Nothing humbles you like a mountain um, or a boulder or all the other shit. Uh, so yeah, that, I was in tears then, and I like that was like day two. No, <laughs> that was that was still Maine. Maine kicked my ass, but it's the best place. I'm going back to volunteer this summer for two months to pay back to the trail with my hands to help rebuild pathways uh, up in Maine and sleep in the woods for a while. So I walked through the seasons of the trail and myself, um, and. Uh, yeah, presidential range, and then, so is you know, I, I had uh, another thing I never normally say, I'm not trying to kill the vibe because we can just move past it quite quickly, but on the night I got my A-level results in Cornwall, very excited to go to Warwick University, studied archaeology, classics and Egyptology, um, I was raped, and it was a really terrible way to begin that process of jumping into independence as a young woman, and I definitely kind of pushed that down inside me for a long, long time, and I had a bit of a ther therapy sessions before I went because I knew it was going to come back up when I was on my own in the woods. And it did come back up, and it was very traumatic, but moving through that was a lot. And so the seasons of myself, as well as, well as the seasons of uh, the woods, was a very healing place to be. Um, and then I, I hurt myself, and I walked quite a long way with a really sore foot after kicking a rock really hard running down on a 30-mile day because someone said, there's beer at the end, it's only a mile away. And uh, I, I <laughs> kicked a rock on the way down. And then uh, I had my foot scanned in hospital after about 300 miles because it hurt a lot. Uh, and uh, it was fine. They said it was a, um, what do you call it, tendonitis. And then it was hiking into the snows because I had to go home for three weeks to let it rest up. It got so bad. And all my trail family went on. I had to make a new trail family. All fine. And then obviously I eventually got to the end. Well, not obviously. I got to the end. And uh, just very quickly to say that the end was nothing like I thought the end would be because our whole vernacular about finishing, completing, sticking a flag in something, I conquered it, it's just bullshit. The whole process, there's not enough things left to conquer, let's let the conquer vernacular die. Because all I did was just become more and more humble. This dirt ribbon that goes through the mountains is edged with the gold of the communities around it, and all it does is it brings you back to your own front door of yourself and all of your shit. And the only, the only junk I left and litter I left on the trail was my own baggage, um, which was invisible to everybody else, but it just looked like, uh, you know, a huge landfill behind me. And when I got here, metaphorically and physically, I was lighter in every single way, but ready to begin again and serve. It was a journey of learning to serve. Um, and I already thought I did quite a lot, you know, but <laughs> this showed me I will never be able to do quite enough. And I think what I also learned is that uh, mindset is everything and broken bits are superpowers. Because when I got home, um, I went to the doctor and I said, oh, oh, it was great, you know, could just check my blood because I feel like a bit, oof, been seven months. And he said, yeah, okay, what's wrong with your foot? And I said, why? It's just a bit black, don't look at it, it's swollen. On the last, day I, last days, I couldn't do up my shoe because it was so swollen. And, uh, you know, like, I was just kind of ignoring it. I can deal with pain, you know, pain's not a fucking problem. He said, let's just get that x-rayed. I'm like, it's fine. I've just done 850 of the last miles with 30 pounds in my pack over mm, 14 Everests up and down. He went, well, just get it x-rayed. <laughs> okay. Two fractures, one displaced for 800 miles I walked on that. Um, because mindset's everything. And that broken bit is my superpower. It tells me now that I can do anything. Don't walk that far on a broken bone. <laughs> um, uh, it's not a good idea. So then I came home. I had tons of plans. 
woo, I need to keep moving. It's really helped with everything. I've processed so much. I'm going to go out and give. I'm going to hike. I've got my permit for the PCT. Um, and then I got my permit for the... I planned to do the Te Aroa straight afterwards, the length of New Zealand. Then COVID. Then I had to sit in a room. Didn't know I had ADHD. You know, sit in a, inside. And I went like bonkers. So I thought, oh... Oh, I'll write a book. So I wrote a book that got published in September last year, um, which was fabulous. It was a real process writing that about the journey of invisible illness, chronic pain, the Appalachian Trail, all the mistakes I made along the way. And that has uh, brought me so much. The process of writing it was brilliant. And I suppose a little like, oh, I can write. I've always wanted to write. And here it is. But the best part of that whole process is what comes back from the other side. The messages, the emails, the thank you for seeing me in your story. I don't feel so ashamed of X, Y, Z. And uh, there's two slides left, by the way, everyone. I will speed it up. Um, thank you. Focus on the foot in the air, not the foot on the ground. This was a quote I read a long time ago. I think it's Deepak Chopra speaking to a monk. I don't know if he's cancelled. I didn't have time to Google that. So if he is, you can take this bit out of the talk. <laughs> but the, um, the quote itself, um, he was with some Buddhists uh, at a monastery and they used to walk barefoot the whole time. And uh, he never walked barefoot, living in a Western-style world, always with his shoes on. And he said to the monk, why, how do you do this? I'm wincing every time I walk. It's agony. And the monk said to him, I only ever focus on the foot that's in the air because at any one time, there's always something that doesn't cause you pain. So don't focus on the foot on the floor. Focus on the one that feels glorious in the air. So through the whole Appalachian Trail, I was focused on the foot that was in the air. And in my life, when things are difficult, when I feel broken, I focus on the thing that's in the air, the love or the gratitude or the person next to me who's telling me a story and I'm reflecting back the things I've learned and they go away feeling better. And then the last thing I wanted to tell you is that, um, oh, now I'm going to, now I'm getting a bit wobbly now. Um, no, I don't know if I can do this. Okay. It's so, <laughs> it's so silly. It's kind of silly. It's, um, so I told you that for me, my passion is young people and helping them step into themselves. And I don't ever really cognitively think about what I'm doing when I'm in the moment with young people. I never think, I'm a great teacher. I only think I might know that somehow because I get told it by people I bump into in the street and sometimes I don't know their names and they're like, Miss Muller. I'm like, oh, hi. And they say lovely things. So anyway, titration, march, the drugs, the ADHD, the panic attacks. I put a post on my Instagram saying, I've had two anxiety attacks and a panic attack next to each other today. I've never had that before. I can't breathe, um, but I'm working through this. And I'm sharing it with you here on my Instagram because you might be going through something really horrendous and feel like it's too much to tell anyone about. But I felt like it was too much to put this on my channel today. But I'm telling you because I think someone out there might need it. Um, and I'm going to get through this, and you're going to get through what you're doing. And if you don't have anyone to tell, please tell me because I'll hold that for you. And um, I had some lovely messages in a reply. And then I got a... Hmm, I got a particular message. Um, oh my God, I'm sorry. This is so do, huh? <laughs> I'm Brand. I'm Brand. Oh, so I'm Brand. <laughs> okay. Whew. I started teaching when I was 26. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. But uh, it was great. So I got this message and it said, Hello, I'm not sure if you remember me, but I was one of your A level philosophy and ethics students at Camborne School. I've loved following your journey on here. And I'm in awe of what you have achieved. I also loved your book and have shared it with my friends and family who've loved it too. I'm sorry to hear you're having a tough time at the moment. And I thought I would message and thank you for a time you helped me when I was having a tough time in my A-levels all those years ago. And I'd like to offer anything I can do to help. I found this card at my father's house with the things I kept that were special and thought Today, you might like a reminder of all the people you have helped through the years and inspired and how much you mean to them, even if you do not ever know it. And then she sent me a picture of this. Dear Charlotte, it's been an absolute pleasure teaching you and getting to know you over the past three years. I will be sad not to see you go through year 13, but I know you'll be as impressive as ever. If you remember one thing as you go through university and beyond, then it should be to continue keeping your self-belief and confidence high. You are an awesome, bright, and beautiful young woman with an incredible future ahead. And don't you forget it when times get tough. You've had a hell of a time over the last 12 months. 
and your poise, gracefulness and courage continue to impress me. You'll be a fantastic doctor or anything else you choose. In the meantime, though, have a crazy, in a good way, summer, and a well-deserved break. Take care, Miss Muller. I was attempting to get you a copy of Cahill Gibran's The Prophet, but I couldn't find one. Read it, it's perfect for everything. Um, <laughs> When I wrote this for this student, I was suicidally depressed and in the most chronic pain, um, and I was deciding what to do with myself. Uh, and I just want to tell you that when you're at your lowest ebb and you feel useless and that you can contribute nothing anymore, you can. You just have to share your goodness, your message, your empathy. Chronic pain gave me chronic empathy. It's the inverse of what I was suffering I could give out. This woman is finishing her PhD and being a doctor and she sent me a message after this saying, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if you had not believed in me and seen me. So I want to tell you that your broken bits are your superpowers too. And you will have changed people's lives when you felt at your very worst you just won't ever really know it. Thank you very much. <laughs>